Hello, my name is Miguel Leva Juarez. I'm a first year thoracic surgery fellow at the Beth Israel Deaconess uh, Medical Center. You get a 65 year old woman with a past medical history of hypertension and diabetes that presented to the ED after an MBA. She has a, a 30 pack year smoking history and currently smokes about a pack of cigarettes per day. As part of her workup, she underwent a CT of the chest, which showed a 1.5 centimeter peripheral spiculated right upper lobe nodule with no underlying mediastinal lymphadenopathy. No suspicious nodules or masses on CT of the abdomen and pelvis were seen. She has been cleared from a trauma perspective and you're consulted to manage this new lesion. Okay, so let's start by defining what a solitary prognosis nodule is. These are defined as single, well circumscribed radiographic opacities that are less than three centimeter and surrounded by aerated lung. Nod nodules can be classified based on the shape, the size, or the amount of nodules that are present. Uh, these can be lobulated, can be speculated, and they can also be round. Um, they can be solid, subsolid, which are also referred as ground glass opacities. Or we can have a mixed density to it. In addition, they can be solitary or they can be diffused. When we face a patient with a newly diagnosed uh, lung nodule, the main thing to establish is what is the pretest probability for lung cancer here? Or what, based on what I'm seeing in the CAT scan and what I'm seeing in terms of uh, risk factor for the patient, what is the probability that this is actually a malignant nodule? The way I approach this is with three questions, which helps me establish that probability. What am I seeing? Or the general characteristics on CT imaging. How has this changed over time? Or the evolution of the nodule and size as well as density? And who is this I'm seeing zone? Or the inherent risk factors on the patient in question? We talked a little bit about the uh, characteristics of lung nodules. Solid speculated uh, nodules uh, with pleural retraction uh, and uh, lymphadenopathy are concerning enough for a malignancy. Whereas those with smooth margins, uh, calcifications, uh, low attenuation, a partial fat density, or any type of popcorn-like calcifications are more suggestive of a benign process like a hematoma or a granuloma. Uh, malignant nodules also tend to be more upper lobe located, but this is not uh, completely exclusive. The next step is to assess what the baseline risk for cancer is for the patient in question. Uh, patients with an elder age, exposure to toxins such as radon, chromium, or uh, arsenic are at a higher risk for lung cancer. Also those with uh, underlying pulmonary disorders such as COPD, ILD, or autoimmune disorders are associated with a higher risk of malignancy. The most important a uh, question to ask uh, when getting a history on a patient uh, with a nodule is uh, the history of um, tobacco use, whether smoke um, and cigarettes or cigars. Given that this is the number one risk factor for lung cancer and uh, both the duration, the quantity and starting age are associated with an inc uh, increased risk of lung cancer. In addition, patients should be asked about any history of malignancy in the past since uh, Malignancies often uh, metastasize to the lungs uh, from different other organs. Infections or atelectasis or consolidations can also sometimes mimic um, lung cancer and uh, oftentimes need to be followed after the index uh, process has resolved to ensure that that finding is no longer there. Finally, the evolution of the nodule is of particular importance here. Lung nodules are common and most of them are benign. Uh, but they can also be associated with uh, neoplastic disorders. Any prior imaging find, uh, studies should be reviewed and assessed for any increase in size or increase in density. Um, this applies for both the nodule and any mediastinal hyalur lymph nodes. Doubling time or the interval between scans uh, for the no nodule to double its size should also um, be assessed and that may help uh, stratify uh, whether uh, a nodule is concerned for malignancy. For, and something important to keep in mind uh, with nodules on a 3D plane is that these are spheric or ellipsoid. So a increase in the diameter as, as small as 26% can translate in increasing the in the double and its overall volume and, uh, and, and size. Among those patients that uh, present with ground glass opacities, both the overall size of the opacity as well as any solid component should be compared. The workup next will depend on the mix of imaging findings, the underlying risk of malignancy um, based on the patient's uh, characteristics, and the evolution of the nodule in time. 
a way to approach uh, newly diagnosed nodules are based on the size. Size is uh, correlated with an increased risk of malignancy. Nodules are less than five millimeters in size, are associated with a less than 1% risk of malignancy. Conversely, nodules that are larger have a higher risk of malignancy. So nodules less than eight millimeters in diameter can generally be followed with serial imaging. The interval of the imaging is going to depend on the underlying patient uh, risk factors and will uh, range anywhere between three to 12 months. For nodules that are eight to 30 millimeters in diameter, um, CT surveillance can be considered in patients with a very low risk uh, for uh, lung cancer or, or absent risk factors. But in general, these patients are going to be the ones that will require further uh, workup. In general, these patients uh, should uh, get a PET CT. A PET CT is a good way to start. This can help risk stratify any uh, suspicious uh, findings for malignancy. This will be increased uptake uh, of MTG or, uh, or hypermetabolic activity. A PET CT can also help rule out nodules elsewhere, as well as uh, see whether there's any mediastinal or, or hilar uh, lymphadenopathy that's suspicious enough to get tissue sampling. However, patients that are very high risk for lung cancer, let's say someone that has a high pack year uh, smoking history or, or has exposure to toxins and an elder age, and the nodule has very uh, suspicious findings such as speculative and uh, pleural retraction, those patients should undergo uh, tissue sampling, uh, especially if um, getting a PET-CT will delay the diagnosis. And, and the main reason here is even despite uh, benign findings on a PET-CT, your pretest probability for lung cancer is going to be high enough that you're going to want to rule it out with the tissue sampling. So what do we do once we have either a hypermetabolic nodule by PET-CT or a high-risk patient with a very suspicious nodule? Well, these are the patients that will require tissue diagnosis and, and staging. The diagnostic modality will depend on several factors, institutional availability, um, suspicious mediastinal findings, um, the expected viability and volume uh, of the tumor, um, or nodule and the anticipated diagnostic yield and location. The three main approaches are uh, through an EBUS with FNA, a transthoracic CT uh, guided biopsy with or without a separate mediastinal staging procedure, or a surgical excisional biopsy with mediastinal lymph node sampling. The benefit of EBUS or endobronchial ultrasound with FNA is the ability to get both the nodule and a biopsy of the mediastinum. This is particularly useful for centrally located nodules that are hilar, peribronchial, or endobronchial, and um, mediastinal lymph node uh, levels that are close to the airway. So, on the other hand, uh, CT-guided biopsies uh, allow for sampling of uh, primarily peripheral nodules, and its diagnostic yield is proportional to a nodule size. This um, has a caveat that does not sample the mediastinum and will require a separate procedure to be able to get a tissue diagnosis if there's any uh, lymph node that's suspicious for mediastinal um, disease. Finally, uh, surgical biopsy by BATS or robotic uh, minimally invasive um, wedge or, or segment uh, will allow to have the highest yield and can be potentially therapeutic for lower stage tumors. It is important here to also perform a mediastinal lymph node sampling to rule out Tyler or mediastinal disease at the time of surgery, since this can change management. An important factor is to consider the patient's underlying fu uh, functional status, the pulmonary function, and uh, the surgical risk. A patient that's high risk for surgery or has a uh, low uh, pulmonary capacity um, will, uh, or that will not tolerate a uh, resection of the nodule, a surgical resection of the nodule, whether it's done for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes, would be a better candidate for tissue diagnosis uh, with one of the other strategies. So in conclusion, when getting a patient with a newly diagnosed nodule, risk stratify the patient and risk stratify the nodule. Smaller nodules, less than eight millimeters in size, can be followed uh, with surveillance uh, CT or any signs of, inc uh, of increase in size. Whereas those that are over eight millimeters in size, unless a patient has absent risk factor for lung cancer, should be worked up with either a PET CT or tissue sampling through EBUS, CT-guided biopsies, or surgical biopsy. Let's go back to the patient in question. 
G has a high risk factor for uh, lung cancer. She's a elderly patient, has a 30 pack smoking history, and is a current smoker. The lesion also has features concerning for a neoplasm, such as the speculated shape and the fact that it's in the upper lobe. In this case, the probability of neoplastic uh, disorder is high enough that it would warrant the tissue biopsy. There are no underlying neosinal lymphadenopathy on CAT scan, so a PET-CT wouldn't necessarily change management here.